Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar on food brands. We thought uh, it might be helpful to all of you who work in food to have a more specific uh, set of guidance as you work on influencer marketing campaigns. So we're very glad you could join us today. Um, I will um, note a few housekeeping items. Um, there is a questions pane on your GoToWebinar uh, uh, section where you can send questions throughout. Anytime you think of one, go ahead and fire it off there. I may or may not see it right away, but I'll certainly answer questions uh, at the end. Amanda and I will both answer questions at the end. We are recording this webinar, and so we'll be providing it to you if that impacts the way you take notes, for example, and anyone else who has registered um, but is not able to attend will also get a copy as well. If you prefer Twitter, you can use at carousel, spelled the unusual way we spell it, C-A-R-U-S-E-L-E, -E, or the hashtag influencer webinar. We're also watching that. So with that, I thought I'd get down to business. Uh, my name is Jim Tobin. I'm the president of Carousel. Um, I started a company called Ignite Social Media in 2007, which is still um, doing well and uh, operating with working on some uh, really strong brands. It's, it's more of a traditional social, well, traditional agency format focused on social media, and then started Carousel which is a different way to do influencer marketing in 2015. I've written a couple books, uh, Social Media is a Cocktail Party back in 2008 and Earn It, Don't Buy It in 2013. Today I'm joined by Amanda Fuquay. She is our senior campaign strategist. So she has been uh, creative lead coming up with the ideas for uh, social media campaigns for brands like Walgreens, Target, Pepsi, Banana Republic, many, many well-known brands. So she's really strong at digital and social strategy and particularly influencer development and project management. So welcome to you, Amanda. Thank you, Jim. So let's get started. We, the way we formatted this agenda is we're starting with three sort of larger watch outs and then five um, things to, you know, things, good things, things to look forward to, things to use to your advantage. So I wanted to start with the first of the watch outs and we'll get real specific here because the general concept that I want to share, you, you are probably all familiar with, which is the FTC is increasingly getting serious about compliance with influencer marketing. We're going to go to a little more detail here, but at the highest level, um, they have been very consistent for several years now on what they want marketers to do. And it's summarized nicely in this letter that they sent to influencers about six weeks ago. They sent it to about 90 influencers who they viewed had, had violated um, their rules. And in a nutshell, if there's any material connection between the endorser and the marketer of the product, you have to disclose that, and you have to disclose it clearly and conspicuously. They are giving, they are rounding out with more and more detail as time goes on, but they've been very consistent. And, I, you know, government agencies don't typically get a lot of credit, but I think they've done a good job here of being consistent and not overreaching, not banning influencer, uh, not being too prescriptive, but saying, guys, you got to make sure people know that this is uh, an, a paid situation. And paid means any connection. It means free product. It means you're married to the marketer. It means you, you know, any material connection that could affect the weight or cred credibility must be disclosed, not just the, the payment of, of money. The other thing that they've become more clear on just in the last six weeks or so is where you need to disclose those connections. So you, you used to be able to put it at the bottom of a blog post. Now they've made it very clear it needs to go to the top of a blog post. But it also needs to go before the more button in, uh, in, in uh, like Instagram, for example. And you can't hide it in a bunch of other hashtags or links where people were doing that a lot. So Amanda, can you uh, give us a few examples here of the, of the good and the bad? Yeah, absolutely, Jim, and um, I'll add to that and just say, you know, at Carousel, we've been saying lately that we're actually really liking what the FTC is doing right now, because um, what this tells us, um, they're showing that they know not only how these social channels work, but that they're paying attention, and they're paying attention because these platforms are increasingly becoming very powerful tools to reach consumers, and the influencer posts are really working. And that's, you know, that's not only just to peak consumer attention, but they're actually converting and driving sales. And so because of that, the FTC has been calling these out, um, it, these, if you will, these cryptic attempts at disclosure for, um, for probably over two years now. And um, in these terms or, or hashtags have been surfacing across these influencer posts that the FTC is now deeming as too vague for acceptable disclosure. 
And that's because Instagram is a really important platform for marketing, um, you know, and, and across beauty, fashion, and food spaces. And um, and you know, while while those close to the industry's inner workings can typically more easily identify which posts are sponsored and which aren't, average consumers might not be able to draw that conclusion quite so simply. So, um, so this tells us that influencer marketing can be a really valuable tool for brands. But the way it's going, the brands and influencers that abide, that abide um, closely to the FTC guidelines are likely to be more trusted by consumers that are reading these posts. So it's really important that the influencers and the brands that they're working with on the sponsored content, they're making sure that the influencers are complying with the most up-to-date guidelines that are being released by the FTC. And so, um, so on this slide, um, here's some examples of um, a post abbreviating this is a sponsored post um, by using hashtag SPON spawn or um, another example um, that's, that's kind of a don't per the FTC is thanks blank brand, um, thanks Tyson, thanks, um, thanks Hershey, um, because it's not really conspicuous as to that this is a paid post or an advertisement. Another one is hashtag partner that is that it's a don't per the FTC. So all posts need to clearly and conspicuously state that this is a paid advertisement by um, by a brand or you know um, a direct solicitation for someone that has that material investment that Jim was that Jim was mentioning in a brand or in a product. Um, so as you can see here, these are a couple of our influencer posts where you can see the hashtag ad very clearly outside the rest of her copy, and it's not clumped into a group of ten or more hashtags or or maybe under the more sign, or it might not be regarded by her readers. Um, so, to, so to kind of sum that up, good and abiding hashtag examples are hashtag sponsored, hashtag paid, or hashtag ad. Um, and, and, and you know, actually for um, for video content, you must verbally disclose the sponsorship at the beginning of the video, and you're really encouraged to repeat it um, throughout multiple occasions throughout your video and say that it is sponsored. Um, and that actually goes for streaming video too. These actually require disclosure throughout for anyone that may have missed it when they were coming into the stream later. So, um, so that's acceptable. That's kind of what's allowed. Um, more of your um, your bad or your um, your unacceptable disclosures are what we just talked about. That um, hashtag spawn, hashtag partner, or just simply thanks brand for um, you know for the product. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see this um, little cheat sheet for you guys, and it's on the accessible placement of the hashtags, um, as well as as what the hashtags are that are acceptable. So it's really the what and the where that's important to note. Excellent. So as we move on to the next sort of watch out, it's it's the budgets are on the rise, which I I think um, you know we we debated internally a little bit: is this a watch out or is this a good thing? Um, I put it as a ultimately as a watch out for a couple reasons. So while you see that CPG food brands at this chart are here at the top of this um, list of brands that are are saying they're getting good return per dollar in terms of earned media um, payback here. And CPG food is at the top of the list. Um, some other things are a little tougher, like casual dining restaurants, but CPG food is doing really well. And as a result, a lot more money is flowing into influencer marketing. You can see 48% of marketers say they're going to increase their influencer marketing budget. Only 4% are going to decrease. So with that, we're seeing in this, this number down in the lower right-hand corner, a 250% increase in influencer fees year over year. And so we have seen that on our programs particularly strongly over the last 90 days or so. Um, there's some articles about how much influencers get paid, some people took that I think as license to jack up their rates um, and the other thing is you know it was sort of a hobby and it's becoming validated as successful so in that case in most any market the, the cost of that is going to go up so as you do this as you do influencer marketing it's important to know what your budget is going in either your budget for the total program if you're handing it off to an agency of some kind or if not if you're doing it yourself your budget what you expect from each sort of influencer relative to the cost. So, um, and I think most people know by now, influencers rarely accept free product as compensation anymore. That was fairly common in 2008 to 2011 or so, and then it began to change um, and is now almost not, typically not done by anybody you'd want representing your brand. So the fact that budgets are on the rise um, suggests that you need to sort of plan for it like you would any other marketing tactic. 
And then something else to note on that is that we're finding that not only, as Jen mentioned, are the prices increasing for the influencers and their rates, but they're also beginning to piecemeal sort of what they offer. And it used to be probably two years ago, we were seeing that the standard um, rate, you could just assume it was going to be a blog post and social shares, but now they're sending through, they're kind of weighting their social channels and they'll send through how much a blog post costs, how much an Instagram post costs, how much they'll do a tweet for, and it's not really a, a group package anymore, um, and you're really having to, to, to kind of think about what platforms you want to activate against and what you can afford based on their these weighted rates. We'll talk a little bit more about how to vet your influencers later in the in the happier side, the, the five positive sides of things. Um, and finally, the the last sort of watch out is to remember that this is different than buying ad space. Now, there's like some good things here. Forty percent of ad uh, ads are now blocked, according to some research, and people are increasingly wary of of ads. Generally speaking, you can also get um, you can also get uh, a lot of content created here. So those are those sort of positive things, but you are working with influencers and that's really new for some of our clients, which they either want to rewrite the influencer's content or they want to be so prescriptive about you know who the influencer is and what the influencer says that it sort of damages the quality of the messaging coming out of it. It also saps the enthusiasm from the influencer and you tend to get less than you otherwise would. So recognizing that you're you're not buying ads and you don't have uh, the pros and the cons of that. You don't have that level of control, but you end up done well getting a more trusted uh, medium out there to impact sales as we'll show when we, we go through this a little bit. So Amanda, when you are working on one of these campaigns, such as Bark Bins, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So uh, something to keep in mind when we're working on some of these programs and we're working with influencers for these brands is that you you know what you want to say about your brand and how you want your brand to be represented, um, but you might not necessarily, or your, or your brand or your product rather, might not own the space. So let's assume that this is the first time you've worked with a particular influencer. Their, per their perception of your brand is probably very much like the end consumer and the way that they're naturally going to think about your brand or how they might associate it with certain things. Um, maybe, maybe they associate it with meals, seasons, or, or specific activities, um, et cetera. And Google Images here, what we're showing now, gives a great visual on what the general consumer envisions when they think of your brand. And the example um, we're showing is Hershey's right here. So when you Google Hershey's, the classic chocolate bar really dominates the top results. And we did a campaign, as Jim mentioned, for this niche product, um, Hershey's Bark Bins, which recently launched. And we had to be very particular on the guardrails and the messaging that we were using to train our influencers and ensure we were getting the right messaging across. Because as you can imagine, um, the messaging that one might use for Hershey's chocolate bars is quite different from um, this Hershey's snack bark then. So this kind of message training, if you will, can be done um, can be done in a variety of ways. The way that we do it is with an influencer welcome packet that you can see right here on your screen. And we use this document as a way to educate the influencer on both the brand and what your particular product is all about and why it benefits them and their readers. So we'll typically start this document with a creative theme or, or sort of like an, an inspirational mantra, if you will, to get it cemented in their heads and get those creative juices flowing. And then from there, we move into the granular details and kind of those watch outs. Um, so you can see some of the information that we have in here. We have important dates. Um, that's campaign dates, their post live dates for each of their particular channels, coupon redemption dates, um, et cetera, just any type of important dates that's going to be relevant for them and their, publish, um, their content publishing. Um, and then we go down to the products, um, product to feature with images of the package. So while they're in the store picking up the product, we want them to be able to go ahead and see what the exact product is and the packaging that it comes in. And then any particular flavors they need to focus on, et cetera, can be all visually laid out here for them. Um, and then from there, we start getting into more of the guardrails of the product, the brand, and the campaign, along with the messaging of that, and then any guardrails. Um, so we'll, go, we'll go ahead and unpack this because all of these are really, really important. 
the messaging of, the, of your brand, the messaging of the product, and then the messaging of the campaign. So let's say that you're let's say that you're Hershey's and you're running a summer um, campaign around around the product launch of Bark Thins. And again, you need to understand how strongly you want to make that connection to Hershey's and what that messaging is around that. So do you want to strongly correlate it with Hershey's brand because because it's classic because because it's trusted and it's a familiar brand, it's a household name, or do you want to shy away from that correlation because it's typically regarded as a sugary snack? Um, next. Um, what about the messaging of the product itself? Um, speaking about Bartson specifically, this product is a sweet and salty snack that's made with kind of elevated ingredients, and it's considered um, it's considered by the brand a balanced snacking solution. And we can get into those um, that kind of verbiage and terms later, and what that what that means for you. Um, but finally, the campaign itself. Do you want that messaging, um, the, the messaging of your summer campaign, to be around leisure snacking or maybe sharing with friends? Or do you want a back-to-school campaign where we can position the snack as more of a, um, a go-to way to escape and indulge throughout your day? And since you're a brand paying for sponsored content, if there is a way that you want the, the product portrayed, or if it's, a brand, um, if it's a brand requirement, then this needs to all go into your welcome packet, and it's part of the influencer's contract with you to follow these guidelines. The whole goal of this welcome packet Sorry, Jim, is to lay out as much information around these specific guardrails as needed while still allowing as much creative freedom as possible. Yeah, we have another webinar on our website that if you're interested you can go you can go listen to on demand. But we talk to four influencers about what they like working with brands, what they don't like working with brands. And it was interesting because they said they both said creative freedom and guardrails. And I think it's very frustrating when a brand says Oh, just do anything you want on Bark Thins or whatever the what the product is. But then when they produce it, say, oh, we really wanted you to portray it this way or we wanted you to emphasize it this way. So clarity and then the creative freedom, I think, is the balancing point here. Absolutely. And just always the best practice, give an influencer as much information as possible on the onset of the campaign before they start creating content because an influencer does not like working with a brand that, as Jim mentioned, doesn't provide these guardrails up front. Then after they see and read the content, then they start coming out with all these stipulations and all, the, all these guardrails around it. <clears throat> So industry roles. Um, so this is another big piece that goes into our welcome packet and is really important for influencers to know. Um, it even got its own slide here. So, um, so definitely a really um, big piece of focus for us. And um, so while an influencer is expected to know and understand the FCC rules um, and the posting requirements around those, they can't necessarily be expected to know the rules or nuances that are specific to your industry. So if you're a company, for example, that is selling a sugary or processed candy or chocolate snack, um, for example, our influencers need to know if you have a brand or any industry guidelines around marketing to children, for example, um, so that they can ensure that their content is not angled toward kids in any way or even positioned as a snack for a child in their photos. And, you know, more specifically, we do have brands that cannot show children younger than 18 years, um, years of age in images whatsoever, whereas others can show children, but an adult must be pictured in the image as well. So just kind of knowing and understanding where your brand stands on this is really important, again, before content is created um, and before any of your legal teams see it posted online. Um, and then secondly, over here to the right, um, you should make sure that influencers know about the claims you can you can and cannot say directly about your product. Um, of course, we, we would check and you should check every piece of content before it goes live um, for all of these guidelines that we've talked um, about up until now. But those that might not seem as obvious, such as claiming that your snack is healthy or, or healthful versus a, a light and balanced snack because of any FDA uh, regulations around it. So, you know, it might be perfectly fine to use certain words such as snack without compromise in the bark thins example or a snack with elevated ingredients, but you cannot directly claim it as a healthy snack. So, well, and it's interesting too, the, the, the lawyers and the clients we work with interpret many of these rules very, very differently. Uh, so one brand may say, uh, we're okay if the influencer says it. Another brand would say, oh my goodness, if the word healthy appears, you know, my lawyers are going to be apoplectic. So, you know, understanding what your 
um, your legal team or, or you know brand guidelines are around those things uh, is important. Yep. And again, just understanding and knowing, making sure it goes into that welcome packet that's being used to kick off influencers um, on the forefront of the campaign. Um, just to reiterate that. Um, okay, so um, so these are um, another couple of things that might not seem as obvious but are also um, very important to your relationships with influencers are a couple of these precautions. Um, there might be some that are specific to the actual product that you want influencers to be aware of, or this might be something that, um, you know, that they would, they, would, they would not necessarily message unless it was a formal part of your ongoing um, marketing materials, but you want to make sure they're aware of it. Um, so for instance, certain ingredients, for example, you want to ensure that they aren't, you aren't sending a snack or a food item that contains milk to someone that's lactose intolerant or products with peanuts to someone that, um, you know, that may have a, a nut allergy. <clears throat> or on the flip side, if your product does contain um, something, like there's a positive um, claim that you can say, like, for instance, maybe it doesn't contain high um, fructose corn syrup, and that's, that's positive. Most people like that. You, you, you know, you might want influencers, you want to call that out to influencers and say you're welcome to use this in your messaging. It's not a, it's not a primary message that we're looking to push, but feel free. Um, so, so be aware of those, just be, um, be, you know, just, just know what's going on with your product and what the influencers can and cannot say. And then over here on the right, this is, this is also something to keep in mind regarding personal backgrounds of these influencers and to really help your relationships with them. Um, organic and, and non-GMO, for example, are, are pretty hot topics for a lot of food and, and even um, lifestyle family influencers. And before you reach out, you should ensure that you do your due diligence and see if they have any personal beliefs or, or maybe some reservations about the product or any of its ingredients before you reach out to them, and, and certainly before they agree to be a part of the campaign. And this is part of what we're balancing on campaign after campaign, even beyond food brands. Um, we had a fitness brand. It was a fitness product, and some of the fitness influencers said, "Well, I don't, I don't use that product, and I, I have my routine, and I don't want to change my routine." This is that you know, you're not buying ad space thing coming back. In that you know, we have people who sometimes some are very you know whatever. Let me let me take a look at it. I'm happy to to do it, and others are you know very firm in their convictions and knowing which, which is important. All right, so that's the, that's the watch out. You made it through the, the less happy side of the agenda, so kudos on that. Now we're going to finish strong with the best practices here. So the first one is to know what success looks like. I mean, obviously our goal um, with any client is to do more than one campaign, right? We want to do many, and we also want to do many because we drive results. And so there are about six different ways we've listed here on how you can drive results and what measurement you can have and it's important to sort of set one maybe sometimes you can have two of these as your goals but you'll see you can't really have all six um, and the first one is obviously the the one that everybody wants which is direct lift can I tell the people who saw this campaign how much more likely they were to buy versus the people who didn't see this campaign and that has been done it has been done in food um, if anyone hasn't seen the silk white wave study done by Nielsen Catalina just hit us up with a note I'm happy to send you the study but it basically found that uh, influencer performed I think it was 16 times better than display ads in terms of the number of people who saw the influencer content and ended up buying silk almond milk um, versus the people who didn't see it and how much they bought and it was a, it was a very valid study. Um, the challenge with that as we get into this is, is it takes roughly $400,000, maybe two fifty, dollars maybe five hundred, dollars roughly $400,000 to do a campaign with sufficient uh, breadth for Nielsen Catalina to measure it in a statistically significant way. You also have to have a product with enough uh, sell-through velocity to get them to be able to look for those sales results. So something like milk was a good a good one because of the buying frequency. So it is doable. The, the one and only one I've seen done um, was extraordinarily strong results. Um, but when people ask for this, it, as soon as you get to the, well, it's about a $400,000 budget, we typically were, move to one of these other five options. Um, correlated lift 
is in some ways the next best. And so we routinely get sales data from our clients and then we overlay um, our campaign metrics on there. Correlation and causality, not the same thing, but we are finding repeatedly for food brands um, that the, the correlation between our campaign appearance and the, and the daily sales um, is strong. So um, correlated lift is a nice way to um, to get close and it's much more uh, it's much simpler to do at, at less budget so um, it is the difficulty is it's hard to get the noise out so we also did an email or we also moved to an end cap whatever those cases may be it's hard to you know distill that out um, in a correlated lift but it is still better than than not looking at anything um, the other one we we do like and we do fairly routinely in our campaigns is share of voice impact so for years brands have been monitoring their television share of voice versus their competitors for example of a hundred percent of the food ads we ran twelve percent of those food ads and our market shares fourteen percent maybe we're not spending enough on TV, those sort of things have been done for decades. Similar in Influencer, we measure the share of voice against some competitors before the Influencer program and then during the Influencer program. There is good long-term research that says for every 10 points of share of voice that you can outperform your competitors relative to your sales market share, you can expect your sales market share to increase one point. So if you can drive an outsized share of voice relative to your competitors, you can increase market share. So that's a good one to measure as well. Um, one I like too is equivalent media value. The reason I like that is because we all as marketers uh, do not have unlimited budgets. If you are on this webinar and have an unlimited budget, I would love to meet you um, and, and, and I'll buy you drinks. Um, but most of the time we're having to decide, do I put this money in influence or do I put this money over here, do I put this money over here? And so equivalent value is a way of measuring for either CPM or CPE or cost per click, whatever, versus what you can get in another channel. Audience attention is an algorithm we created to measure how much time people spent with this content. And then finally, um, how much money did you save by getting this content created for you? So. If you do a banner ad campaign, for example, you pay for the space and then you have to have someone, an agency or someone develop those banner ads at an additional cost. Part of influencer marketing is creating the content and at least the way we do it, you get rights to use this content going forward um, and it's therefore can be pretty valuable to have this pre-tested uh, content to use on your website, on your social channels, whatever the case may be. So the as as you move beyond that, picking the right people. This if we get this right, the rest of the campaign typically does very very well. So little little cartoon here for you. Um, it's not one thing we like to say is it's not about the influencer. It's about influence. And you know, just picking someone with a big social following is really not the way to go. It's um, it. It tends to cost more per unit, per impression, per click, per engagement um, as people go up, which I'll talk about actually on the very next slide. Um, and it tends to be less effective. So we tend to have good luck, and this is all actual content we've created in our in some of our food campaigns. We tend to love to live in this power middle. So influencers with between 10,000 and 5 million followers, we will sometimes use these content specialists in the 1,000 to 10,000 range because if we get really great content, a really good photographer, or um, for Hallmark we used a stop motion uh, videographer, if we can get great content, we can manufacture reach much more easily than we can manufacture passion or manufacture good content. And so what we find here is in this, this, this power middle in particular and occasionally in content specialists, we get great bang for the buck. When you get up to these celebrities, the cost per uh, for the celebrity hockey sticks up and the research suggests that the efficiency drops dramatically. So trying to find influence from inspiration, aspirational ideas Recipes, this is a recipe for Canadian lentils, for example, one of our clients to the right here of the power middle on the pyramid. Um, and really, I think the important thing there is the recipe, not whether it was done by Bob or Sue or Jane, does this recipe look enticing to you? So inspiration, aspiration is better generated um, from the power middle.
Yeah, thanks, Jim. And that's a perfect segue into what we're about to talk about, um, and how to vet and select the right influencers. As Jim just mentioned, the best way to ensure that you're a, um, you're about to get the most reach and to manufacture that reach is first finding the right influencers. And, and, and I'll start by saying, you know, continue to reach out and grow your network, but also ensure that you're nurturing the relationships that you currently have. Um, here at Carousel, we embrace a network building approach to our influencer marketing, and we make sure that we are always continuing to nurture and keep in touch with all of our influential contacts. And this is even after a campaign is over, um, and, you know, working with them on multiple campaigns throughout the year, kind of keeping that relationship going, um, you know, reaching out, sending them cards, having drinks with them after work, you know, just keep that keep that um, that conversation line open and alive. And you know, and this method's proven really successful for us. Um, so this first this first um, area here, um, consider audience insights. So we kind of we kind of take a unique approach to finding and vetting influencers for brands. Um, and then this one thing we always ask a brand um, when we're getting briefed, um, one of the first things really is what is your audience insights? If you know if, if you can give us a, a breakdown of the detailed audience data that that goes into geography, um, demographics, uh, purchase behavior, maybe the types of content that they're um, consuming and where, such as long form posts um, or videos. You know what's really engaging them. Any insight into these interests and digital habits, it not only helps to determine what type of influencer to contract for your brand, um, and, and for this particular campaign as well, we kind of get granular in that sense, but it also allows us to take it a step further and reach consumers that are likely going to be interested in your brand and ultimately drive first-time users. So, um, so for instance, let's say that we're running a, um, a campaign for Tyson Chicken. Um, I'm not just looking for influencers that love chicken fingers. <laughs> we uh, we certainly want influencers that that like chicken fingers, of course, for that authenticity play um, and those kind of precautions that we talked about um, earlier. Um, however, we also want to understand who their audience is. Is the audience of Tyson someone that is someone that's on the go and someone that's a young professional and a city dweller, or is it a busy mom that prefers quick weeknight meals? And knowing this helps us, uh, helps us determine and find that right set of influencers to create content that their audience is looking for and sharing anyway. So regardless of who that influencer is themselves, um, if they're already a fan of Tyson, um, you know, we can put it in their hands in a relevant way to share with an audience that is likely going to be interested in that product anyway. Um, so Jim's, Jim's going ahead, but um, kind of a match. I'm, I'm trying to guess when you want me to click, and I, I got that one a little early. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not any kind of sign to you, Amanda. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to tell everyone about how I look at influencer as a matchmaking service, but I will I will move on. Um, <laughs> um, so so anyhow, um, I just it, it's just important again that we have that background information. It really makes us um, create educated um, partnerships with our influencers and um, and allows us to go deeper than just looking at who is this influencer and do they create great content. So um, I'll digress from there and move on to um, audience and objectives. Um, so this is really worth noting the importance of matching your target platform to your audience and your objectives. So this is also something that we work closely with brands and influencers to do while we're building out the strategy around a particular campaign. Um, and it will be dependent of, upon both who the influencer is and what they're looking to do. Um, so for instance, if, you are, um, if you're looking to target millennials, for example, you might automatically assume that maybe Instagram or, or Snapchat here are your go-to social channels. But the, if the objective of your campaign is to, is to drive clicks to a website or maybe coupon redemption, then neither of those are going to necessarily be the best platform to put all your content focused on. Um, or the nature of the program makes a difference as well. If you're looking for, we'll go back to that, um, that back to school and Tyson chicken angle. Um, so if you're looking for a back to school program or maybe wanting to drive holiday sales or recipes that your product is featured in, then you might look to focus your content type on long form recipe blog posts and publish those across Pinterest. So you really have to consider where your audience is and what content they're engaging with on their channels. Um, and then also whether those platforms are gonna, are gonna serve your objectives. And finally, um, and kind of working backwards here, but diversify with tiers in your influencers. Um, 
And you know, when you're thinking about who you're going to work for to create your content, again, we can manufacture great reach. We cannot um, manufacture great content. So this middle group here, um, influencers that with audiences align with your brand messaging and are more likely to engage with content, they line up with your audience and audience insights, they create great content, and they're kind of that power middle that we've discussed too. But in tandem, you also want to begin building this network of brand advocates. These guys might not have the biggest social following, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but the point is is that they bring passion to your brand and they really connect with your particular product as well. And um, <clears throat> that's whether you've worked with them multiple times in the past um, and you know they, they've kind of um, organically become these advocates or they may just be super familiar with your product. Maybe it's a product that they use and love or it's just right up their alley um, for, for weeknight meals or recipe making or, or if they're fitness gurus, whatever, whatever the product may be and how it aligns with, the, with that influencer. But it's perfect for them and therefore they're going to be so excited to partner with you. So again, whatever it may be, these guys put passion behind their content, and then you can go to amplify that content um, and in front of your target audience. <laughs> um, I was guessing again, did I get it? I'm, I'm just a little too quick on the draw. I'm sorry, Amanda. That's great. That's great. Uh, we can we can go right into that. Um, so we mentioned earlier um, about the importance of these of these factors of creative freedom, and it really is so true. And that's why I've dedicated a slide to it because it really allows for more engaged audience. I'm sorry, more engaged influencers, audiences, and authentic content. And this is data from a survey of influencers, and you can see the one thing. Um, over three three quarters or 77% um, of influencers responded that the number one factor that makes U.S. influencers likely to work with a brand more than once is that creative freedom. And um, don't get me wrong, being compensated was their close second, but I was really excited to see a piece of data that um, you know reinforces my advocacy for creative influencer marketing strategies that focus on the individual strengths of each influencer and allows them to create content that's going to resonate with their audience because they know their audience best. Um, and that's one of the things that the I think the FTC is going to get to eventually. So right now they're still trying to you know, lasso this industry a little bit, get everybody to sort of play by these rules. But the other thing I think that's ultimately going to come into this is most of the disclosures you see say, yeah, I was compensated for this, but all opinions are my own. If you as a brand rewrite all the content, that disclosure just became a false statement. So at some point, if it's if it's really just sort of a cut and paste of something the, the brand wrote, then the FTC, I think, will go after somebody for for that, and so there's another cautionary reason to not be too prescriptive. Um, you're paying these people for their opinions. They are saying, "I am being paid for my opinion." Um, you can't really rewrite their opinion uh, too heavily here. So um, that I think we're a bit away from that happening, but it'll likely happen in I don't know maybe two years. That's my prediction, Amanda. You didn't see that one coming, did you? I did not. Did not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. So, um, so thanks, Jim. Um, how do we balance having guardrails and having this creative freedom? Uh, we provided this checklist here um, just to give you some examples of the way that you can loop influencers in with enough information that they have the creative freedom they want, but also make sure that they don't come back with content that doesn't really support the message of the brand or even lacks the, the aesthetic that the brand is going for in the visual content. And that's something that we coach influencers on is not just what does the content say, but how does it look? And um, you know, and you know, furthermore, things like important dates, product imagery that we just talked about, key messages, um, any guardrails specific to your industry. These are the types that you want to, um, the types of information that you really want to bake into that welcome packet, or at least a very concise document that um, that's short and sweet, but you know, relays everything that you need it to. And um, as you can see here in these images, this is a campaign that we did with the mock chocolate, and we did just that. We worked with influencers to provide guardrails around both the messaging of the product, and then we wanted them to create a certain aesthetic that's going to drive our target audience to trial it. And you can see this is beautiful, clean, um, colorful, but not too much so. 
So we allowed them to make that, um, to have that creative freedom, and they were able to create a story of their own. Like these are not product reviews. We worked closely with each influencer to determine and create actual stories and weave it into things that their readers already know about them. So it feels very authentic. Um, just some examples here. You can see that this one influencer that um, lives in Southern California took the campaign to the beach with her because that's where her influencers can find her most of the time. Another one hosted a party at home, and these were the beautiful centerpieces. Um, one talked about having um, or creating an escape at home and you know how to wind down after a long day by pairing it with her her red wine. Um, several dining al fresco. Again, also each of these had their own different spins. So um, you know, we just we just work with influencers on their 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 content. We really educate them. We work one on one with them, and it, it ends up being content that's that's truly amazing. And finally, thank you, Jim. <laughs> when you have that great content, you have to develop a, an amplification plan and figure out ways to get this out to the right audience. So with the right plan, the content can be, um, can be recycled, if you will, to be even more effective for you. And, and if you're working with good content to begin with, people are more likely to, to share and engage with that content, and it's going to do well on its own organically. So here's just a couple of examples of the type of amplification that we look at. Um, the first one here is secondary syndication. It's the approach that we often take. Um, you know, we think. How can we reach as much of our target audience as possible without the, um, the often enormous expense of having each influencer create content of their own, maybe by working with an expensive photographer and then post it on their own channels? It, it can get quite expensive and time consuming for each of these influencers. So our, our solution is, is to enlist a second wave of influencers that are both like-minded but also align with your brand. Um, we, we take into consideration the same audience insights that we discussed earlier, and we work with these secondary influencers to create content, uh, I'm sorry, to share content that has already been created and is, is was high performing to share across their own channels. And you can see this influencer, um, her name is Celeste. She caught out a piece of content from New York City Pretty, thanking her for introducing her to the to the Walgreens app, working in those same key messages that the original influencer did, um, and then also using required SEC hashtag. And secondly, um, this this is for one one for when you have the right relationships with influencers, but it can be very very effective. Um, this is a difficult amplification strategy because it requires an influencer to share their username and password with our team in order for us to get in and put media dollars behind their content. So a lot of trust is required there, but it's a highly effective way at boosting the best performing con um, content. And you know that amplification is kind of centric to our organic approach here at Carousel because we're able to, to again boost content that's organically performing well and do so in a very targeted way to efficiently um, hit those right audiences. Um, another type um, here, the media placements. Um, this is a, uh, an approach that we implement that uh, that's pretty unique. Um, you can do like native advertising, or in this case, we use influencer content to create a feature story by using the images and quotes from some of the campaign content to create a, um, a an incredible article that was then published across hundreds, um, if not thousands, of local print and digital media outlets across the country. And um, this one was going after a, a sort of older demographic. So this allowed us an, an even broader reach outside of the social channels um, using influencer content, but in a more traditional sense. And finally, um, there's our social activations. And um, these can be activated across any social channel, really, with slightly tweaked um, execution strategies. Um, but you know, we'll figure out whatever is the most appropriate for your campaign and, um, and product, kind of what we talked about earlier. So social activations are, um, the objective is, is to engage our audience to further amplify the content and even add to an existing, even add an existing layer um, to our content that already exists. So in this case, it was um, an, a UGC activation across Instagram that highlighted um, existing influencer content and used them as props to encourage their followers and people within their network 
to create a piece of content and contribute to the activation um, itself. And this one, in certain cases, and this one um, specifically, it can actually drive product trial and sales directly because the the participants actually needed to go purchase a V8 water to feature in their content. And the incentive is also often to win a type of customized prize pack. And it's, you know, it, 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 the influencers become, or I'm sorry, the participants become curious to try the product. Um, they want to participate, create their own content, and then there's a chance to win a great prize. And that worked well with Pepsi emoji as well, um, a, similar, a similar sort of thing. But um, the, I think the important takeaway here is so much influencer marketing is influencer writes posts, influencer does social shares, and it ends there. And that's really um, leaving it short, if you will. If you can't uh, figure out which of these pieces is doing best and then get them in front of the people with you know highest propensity to buy, you're only really getting half of an influencer program. So there's one other way you can get more money out of your campaign. So once you finish this up with this, Amanda. Yeah. This is actually my favorite slide, um, and not because it's the last one. It is... I, I love that our brands can leverage content even far after a campaign has ended. And it's really a best practice for brands during the campaign even, that they're engaging with the influencer content, they're, con they're commenting, maybe retweeting a post. Um, that you can really take this a step further if, if you've worked out the proper licensing agreement up front with your influencers. There's so many ways to use and reuse this content um, again, long after a campaign has ended, and these are a few um, a few examples. This one right here on the far left is an, one of our influencers' images on a billboard in Times Square, and it's one of my favorite success stories because our client called up a few months after the campaign had ended and said that she she just wanted to let us know that one of our influencers, her face was going to be um, featured in Times Square, and told us the story behind it that she found out kind of last minute that. She had a space in Times Square for this billboard. She did not have any idea what she was going to use to feature. She knew she wanted to, to play up this Love is On campaign, but otherwise she didn't know what she was going to use and started pricing it out between models, hair, makeup, all the things that go into production. It was going to be thousands, tens of thousands of dollars, and she was able to take this image that we had sent her high res and pop it over to the team and saved her a ton of time and a ton of money. Um, the influencer was even so excited. She did not um, live locally here in New York. She flew up um, to Times Square, took pictures with the with the content, and was just so so excited to be you know given. She felt very honored by it. Um, moving on from here, you can see a piece of Red Nose Day content was featured. Um, the People's Choice Awards during one of the awards ceremony. Um, one of our influencers was featured in the Walgreens bring photo, um, photo album and that it was available in store and it showed a picture of her and her daughter that um, she had used for one of the photo campaigns and a quote from her, one of her pieces of content. And they used, I think, about six to ten influencers throughout that, um, throughout that catalog that year. Um, we have a Walgreens posted a, um, a piece of content from a beauty program. It's being used on website. This Pinterest board has been long living. That's why it's featured um, after the campaign ended months after we found that there was more followers and more repents of the content than it had been during while the campaign was live. So again, just to, just to recount, there's so many different ways the content can live on, um, and there's just so much value for the brand here. Excellent. So that's that's some of the watch outs and, uh, and opportunities for food brands such as yourself. We did have some questions come in. I wanted to get to those. First of all, one of our closer friends on the uh, webinar wished you a happy birthday, Amanda. So thank you for spending your birthday with us. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> um, we had another question about uh, speak about how disclosure rules apply to influencers with whom brands have relationships, even if they're unpaid. For example, if you're just sending samples and marketing materials to influencers and they post about the brand voluntarily, what are the rules there? Do you want to start with that, Amanda? Um, I would prefer if you started with that, Jim. Fair enough. <laughs> My, my uh, according to what we saw with the FTC, that is a, um, that is a relationship that has to be disclosed. And so, um, you know, the, the, they would argue that their guidance has been fairly clear that if there's any sort of 
um, relationship here that would that could potentially impact their posting, then you need to disclose it. And so um, it's it's a little um, it's a little tricky. But regardless of whether you're paying an influencer or just sending them samples and marketing materials um, and not requiring them to post, you still have that relationship that is leading to them posting. And so um, you need to go ahead and and dis and they need to dis to cook to disclose that. The other thing I, I think from an FTC standpoint that's likely to happen in the next six months, they're going to come down on a brand in a significant way. They've been fairly tipping around at the margins with some warnings to, I think it was Lord and Taylor and a few others, um, but somebody's going to get fined and somebody's going to be made, um, made the example of, um, and I don't want it to be any of our clients. So, um, done well, done with testing content, you know, anything that comes across as cheesy just sort of bubbles to the bottom of the test and isn't syndicated in our, in our model, um, and the high-performing stuff does. So I would suggest in this environment be careful, um, be careful with FTC guidance because I think they're going to be coming for somebody soon. So Amanda, this one is, I think, good for you. And what are the best tools to use to find influencers? Well, we use several different tools. We have a whole database that has, um, the, the number continues to grow, but last time I checked, I believe that it was 35,000 different influencers within that database. We will we'll start with that, and we will search it, and have, we have different kind of kind of qualifications that we'll look for with each of our influencers. We're able to, um, to work together as a team to share comments and feedback about the, uh, the kind of our experience with those influencers. But as I mentioned, we really like to work with the same influencers over and over and develop like those that have proven themselves. They create amazing content. They're wonderful to work with and the brand loves them. If, if a brand comes back to us for second or third programs, we will definitely try to use the same influencers over and over for those programs. They become these, these authentic advocates. Their followers are seeing the same content. I'm sorry, not the same content, but the same product and, um, and messaging on their, on their site. And, and it becomes very organic. So we like to reuse those influencers while, while weaving in new ones as well and really growing that network for you of what we call ambassadors. And so, so again, it's, it's, that, um, it's that manual approach to keeping these and maintaining these relationships. But then we also use this database to vet and and find new influencers as well so it's kind of a two-pronged approach yeah and one of the there's a lot of tools out there of influencer databases one of the watch outs there um, would be the quality of the content um, and making sure not there are not a uh, hundred thousand fantastic content creators out there in the food space um, so i would be you know you the, we spend more of our manual effort at the front side of picking influencers and figuring out sort of the storylines almost of why would they want to write about this than anything else. And if you get that right, the rest of the campaign just goes beautifully. Um, so I wouldn't skimp there and I wouldn't automate that too much. Um, another one I'll, go ahead. I would say even when you do use your, um, your larger database, um, even then after you, you can narrow that search down, as Jim was saying, it becomes a very manual process. We're looking to make sure that the influencers, what they're talking about, what they've talked about in the past, making sure that they are exactly um, the right fit for you um, based on, again, uh, uh, visual content and then also those, um, those, those demographics and audience insights that you provided us. And two more questions, and we will finish um, right on time. Um, what is the recommended annual budget brand should be setting aside for influencer marketing? Um, that is uh, a tough one. It depends a lot on what your overall brand is for your your area, whether you're brand marketing or shopper marketing. Those sorts of things come into effect. But what I would say is that this is not. Um, it, it, to me, it, it's similar to a media buy. Um, nobody uh, at, a, at sort of a household CPG brand expects anything to happen with a $10,000 media buy. You shouldn't expect anything to happen with a $10,000 influencer buy. So, um, you know, our programs are most often 50000 and above. If you want to do an annual budget, 
um, and for the sort of ambassador campaigns that Amanda looked at, you can be very quickly, you know, half million dollars to to a little more, depending on how frequently, how many, how it's a scale question, like any advertising, um, how many how many pieces of content, how far do you want that content to go? Um, so it's it's a tough question with all everyone's different sort of priorities and needs, um, but I would say if you think of it like anything else you're going to spend money on in marketing, uh, you'll probably land at the right the right budget area. And finally, Amanda, then Amanda, I'll let you take this one. What is the most successful social activation you have implemented aside from a Twitter party? Oh, I would say that is a tough one. We love Twitter parties if it makes sense for the audience and the, again, the objectives. Um, I think I think one of our most successful ones was actually an on-site event where um, we had influencers go into a salon and we were it was a very New York City um, regional focused program and we had uh, I think 10 to 12 influencers go in store create live content on site to really kick off this this product launch um, in New York City at um, at specific retail stores, and after that event, they went home and created a kind of long form content after using the product a little bit longer, and um, and then social shares after that. So it was a nice, a nice kind of big push to kick off um, in that social activation, and then we we kept the momentum going with all of that content, and we were able to see correlated lift in brick and mortar stores in the New York City area since the launch during that four week period that the campaign was running, and that's always been a really um, a really a really big proud point for our team. So I would say that that live event would have been um, one of the most successful, but we've also had great success with the with the Instagram loop that was um, that was showcased in this deck, where we had our influencers push out content that was created for the campaign with prompts to asking their influencers to participate, create their own content, and we got some gorgeous UGC from that that the brand ended up using um, quite some time afterward for um, for marketing efforts. The other one that came to mind as you were talking, the Pepsi emoji program we did um, got, I think, 1,300 pieces of UGC submitted. Um, that one I was pretty pleased with. And then Hills Brothers Coffee, another food brand that's regional, um, had over 300,000 sweepstakes entries as part of this uh, influencer program. So um, when people get excited, they can, they can react. And when they react, they socially share. And when they socially share, sales go up. So, um, well, with that, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you all for spending your hour with us. I hope you find this helpful. Um, if you need us, you can always reach us at Carousel on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or on our website, carousel.com. I am Jim Tobin. Amanda Fuquay, thank you so much um, for all your time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Jim. And with that, we are done.